want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 33, Isaiah chapter 33, and if you're physically able, would you stand together um, out of love and respect for the reading of the Word of God this morning, Isaiah chapter 33. I'm just going to read three verses for you uh, this morning. Isaiah chapter 33. I was in a store several years ago. In fact, I remember it was during, uh, during the COVID crisis, whatever you want to call it. And um, I overheard an employee behind a counter, one of the stores. It was somebody I knew speaking to a, a, a customer. And um, uh, that man was not a saved man, but he made a statement to the customer. He said, we need to have classes that explain our liberties and our rights to us. You know, there's a day that that was just a part of your education. I mean, that was part of uh, public education, a part of Christian education at a time when those two were intertwined together. And uh, a man that's not a Christian yet even realizes that even America does not recognize where our liberties come from and how biblically they have been uh, intertwined into our lives. Isaiah chapter 33, verse number 20, the Bible says, Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet ta habitation, a tabernacle, that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the, lo the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit that has inspired it, Lord, will have a message for us today. Lord, uh, not from the mind of a man, but from the heart of our God. And Lord, um, from, the, uh, from your word, Lord, not to be as others who are destroyed, as you said, for a lack of knowledge but, Lord, to be strengthened because of it. And we just pray that today, that, uh, Lord, that your spirit would fill uh, the hearts of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we'll give you our thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. You can be seated this morning. There are different types of governments. There is, uh, there is a monarchy that has a king. There is an aristocracy. That's where the rich rules over the poor. Uh, there is an oligarchy where a few rule over many. There's a dictatorship where one rules over all. There is a theocracy, that is where God reigns in, in government and is in authority over government. There's a republic. And a theocracy is God's intent for government. Theo means God. It means that God has established a form of government and a nation of citizens follows God's law and authority. That's good for any nation in this world, not just our nation, not just for Israel. Uh, but it begins with what God said to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Just like we, our national motto is in God we trust. For Israel, it is that verse, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It acknowledges the Lord who, is, who always is and has been and always will be as the Almighty God and recognizes Him as Lord as a sovereign governing authority. And then we have Isaiah chapter 33, verse 32. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Now, if you're looking for an outline, each of those statements is it this morning. And it'll take me a minute to get there. But we've, here in Isaiah chapter 33, Israel was um, living, uh, the kingdom of Judah was under the rule of King Hezekiah. By and large, Hezekiah, Hezekiah was a very good and a very godly king. At this time, the nation of Assyria, which was a greater nation, a more powerful nation, a nation that would have had already invaded the, the, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, was had its eyes on the southern kingdom of Judah. And this is one of the few moments in Israel's history where she was living uh, as far as the kingdom of Judah, the house of David, was living righteously and in submission to God's authority in, in civil government and in biblical worship. And God had, uh, they could see that Assyria had their eyes towards them and the people have cried out to God and God has pronounced a woe on the enemies of Judah. 
uh, speaking of that nation of Assyria, if you used to back up and read the chapter in its context in its entirety. And God is going to deliver them. In fact, if you was to read on in chapter 36, you find the invasion of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. And we find that God did not do as with Gideon and did with 300 against over 100,000. The angel of the Lord himself went out and slew 185,000 in one night. The angel of death went out from the presence of the Lord and slew the enemies and defeated the enemies of Israel. Because God was ruling over his people. He was their judge. He was their lawgiver. And they were living in, in submission to his law. And as their king, he divinely protected his people. I, you could you go throughout our history and a, a nation that chose God uh, to be uh, our go to, that chose to be one nation under God, there are many, many accounts in our nation's history, just in the life of General Washington, how many times that it was recognized, not just by himself, but by those who witnessed uh, accounts in battle where he had been divinely protected. Even uh, in the French and Indian War, n native chiefs that recognized that Washington had a God that protected him and he could not be defeated in battle. He'd come back with his coat full of bullet holes and yet not one bullet in his body. I mean, there are numerous accounts and uh, there are many others. God divinely protecting those that lived under there. And, and, and they acknowledged that as they were living under God's righteous rule, they acknowledged how God ruled over them in a theocratic triune way. He was their judge, their lawgiver, and their king. Now God's system of government has always been theocratic. It's always been a God-governed uh, authority that, uh, that, that rules over civil authority. The Garden of Eden was a theocracy. Yeah, and, but, with a, but in all government, there is a a system and a stewardship that goes with that. God's system is a theocratic system, but the stewardship of God's government is in the hands of the citizens, which is why you and I have a republic. And as Benjamin Franklin said, uh, when he was leaving after the Constitution had been ratified in Philadelphia, and he walked out of the, down the, the steps of the, uh, of the Congress and out into the street, a woman stopped him on the, the street, and she said, Mr. Franklin, what form of government have you given us? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And we haven't done a good job of keeping it. They did for many years, but we haven't in recent years. By the way, a republic is when you go back, it's to republicize that which God has established in a theocratic form of government. And with just two people on the earth, let me just encourage you a little bit. God only had two people to rule over in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. How did it go? Not well. And then from there, it didn't get better. It got worse. In fact, it got so worse that within 2,000 years, when the average lifespan of a man was over, over 900 years of age, that in the world of Noah, God had to destroy man from the face of the earth and start over again with, with one man and his family. By the way, God always begins, he starts with nations beginning with one man and one woman. He begins with a home. Nations are composed of their home. Curtis Hudson always said, as goes the home, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes the nation. So it began with Adam and Eve. And then it began with Noah, preserving them through the great flood. And, and, and when Noah got off the ark in Genesis chapter 9, God put another stewardship. He said, okay, we're going to see if we can form a better form of government, a more perfect union between God and man in government. That's the title this morning, if you wanted, a more perfect union. Those words are in our, in our very um, uh, founding documents given us by the founding fathers. That, that, and God, in seeking to form a more perfect union in his relationship between man, he, he established that the, that the civil government would be established based on the sanctity of human life, protecting innocent life, born or unborn. But then the world of Noah tried to exclude God from government as soon as Nimrod came along. Uh, you won't find that separation of church and state in the Constitution, as, as sometimes lawyers say, or in the Bible. They're part of a threefold cord that's not quickly broken between the home, civil government, and the church. 
But new, Nimrod attempted what today's world is attempting, a globalist government without God's interference. And God confounded the languages of the, of the families of the earth and divided it into its present nations and, and started over with Israel, who also eventually rejected God's theocracy in favor of a monarchy, which wound up being their destruction. Look, there's always been an effort in mankind to produce a better form of government. A more perfect union. Man needs to be governed. Look at what happens in lawless, when, when lawlessness prevails. Our behavior needs government. We need a system and a law of morals to keep us on a righteous path that has to be defined. In fact, James Madison once said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. We're not angels. And it's impossible for a nation to maintain civil government according to its divine inception without uh, this understanding. Our, our founding fathers certainly knew that they could not establish a more perfect union, a better form of government, without God's governing authority and influence. George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God in the Bible. That means anywhere in this world, any nation. Do you understand our forefathers could not conceive of a government without God? They also understand that separation of church and state was only given because coming from England, the, the head of the church was the king of England who ruled over the church of England, one church for the entire, for the entire nation, and that's why Bible-believing Christians were looking for a place where they could uh, serve and worship God freely according to the dictates of the Bible, not the dictates of a king, and all that that separation of church and state in a private letter, a personal letter between Jefferson and the Danbury Baptists of Connecticut, all that it was meant was that the government would not, we would not, America would not establish a government that would dictate the church, but that never meant that the church was not to be a part of of the government. And it's, there was a day when you could not vote in this nation unless you were a church member. There was a time when you about couldn't get elected as a delegate to the Continental Congress unless you were a pastor. Because when peop, the, the only thing that people had that brought them together as an assembly of citizens was a church, even before they had a public education system. And so it just stood to reason that the one pe person that everybody looked to as they, as they assembled locally was their pastors. The only reason that you have the first uh, of the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, is because of, of a conversation between James Madison and an independent Baptist pastor. Now look... We, he, Washington said to the nation in his farewell address that religion and morality are indispensable supports of our political prosperity. You're not going to find separation of church and state. We're going to find where, the, where the, the state had no authority over the church, but that the church had every influence to hold the state to a standard that was set by God. You know, our, our founding fathers established our government based on this knowledge. To be free, you had to have a republic. To have a republic, you needed a constitution. To have a constitution, you needed morality. To have morality, you needed religion. And they established a religion based on faith in Jesus Christ and his word. John Hancock wrote in April, in, in 1775, in April of 1775, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. Be good if we get back to that as the attitude of America today. John Adams said this, the general principles, our second president, upon which the fathers had achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. He said, I will, he was one of them, he would know. I will avow that I believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are his eternal and immutable, that means without change, as the existence and attributes of God. And that's why they, when they gave us a declaration of independence from tyranny, not just from taxation, but by that time in America, England had found its way over here and was starting to establish state churches. That's why they said, by the way, do you even understand that 
you would not have no freedom of religion without God, that during the millennium when Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years, if, if you were to go and, and read in the prophets that it says that every man, will, we will walk in the name of our God and every man will walk in the name of his God. Do you understand that during that time when Christ rules as king for a thousand years on this earth, that not everybody's going to follow him? He'll let them still walk in the name of their God? That's why they said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's a democracy. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, I think we're there today, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its such powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And you know what principles they found most likely to affect their happiness? It was the biblical principles of Christianity. Did you, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, the doctrines of Jesus are simple and to the happiness of man. I, I said this Wednesday night. We look at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as the way to live any way we want. Nobody tells us what to do and so that we can be happy with whatever, whatever pleases us. That's not what they had in mind. They wanted us to have his life, the life of Christ, because he gave his life for us. They wanted us to have divine liberty, which is not the right for a man to live as he pleases, but for us to live as pleases God. And that hap there's no greater happiness than in, than in man living in a right relationship with God. Fifty-six men signed their names to those words, pledging their lives, their fortunes, their sacred trust, and most of them died penniless and with broken health because they actually believed those words were worth living for and dying for. Now, I fear, friends, that we've lost some of our, our sac the sacred fire of our patriot hearts. John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail on July the 4th, 1776, the day that, that this was a, the Declaration was adopted. The Declaration of Independence was adopted by the Continental Congress. And she's, he said that this day ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. He said, look, I, there's nothing wrong with you gathering your family together and having fireworks and a barbecue, but there's something wrong when a Christian people have forgotten the foundation of a Christian nation. And that we don't pause. I don't know about you, but uh, uh, this, this past week, I took per time in my personal devotions to just pause and remember who we are and how we got here. And to th think about, even though I was not there to witness the price that was paid, I am aware of the price that was paid. That Declaration of Independence gave, after eight years of war, they finally were able to give us a constitution that says, we the people of the United States. Before that, that was colonial America. Now this is the first, this is where they become, this is where we became the, the United States of America in 1783. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, uh, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Uh, if you haven't read the Constitution, you ought to read it. It's not that long. You could read it in 15 minutes or less. And if you have read it, it's kind of like your Bible. It's one of those things that would be good for you to go back to again and see where we came from. Because we have, we've lost our ways. We've gone so far off the path. We've so lost our way that, that we don't even remember where home base is anymore. And somebody has to. But let me just say this. A more perfect union does not mean a flawless union. America is not without our flaws. It implies one better than those before. It implies improvement. Civil governments have always been tainted by the inherited, this inherited sin nature of Adam, of Noah, passed on to us. And it's all but impossible to avoid. But if we move towards God and the Bible and will establish our government beneath the government that God had intended, 
We can move towards a more perfect union and secure the blessings of civil and religious liberties. By the way, you read those documents, you're going to find certain words are capitalized. Because they, in their time, when they capitalized that word, like the word union and justice and tranquility and blessings and welfare, they were all things that they sought from a divine influence. And they made that very clear that that was through God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Alexander Hamilton also said this, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of divinity itself and, never, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. He said that what forms civil liberty is written by a divine hand. Those, our founding fathers were men of great faith in God and the Bible. Uh, they were rugged industrialists, to be sure. They had pioneer spirits. They had uh, very political views for the future of our nation. Uh, but they had fervent hearts and fiery spirits. And, that, and boy, when they came to... The, you understand, that constant, once that, that war for independence was won from England, that wasn't the end of it. There was a great battle. There was great turmoil in our nation to give us that Constitution. That Constitutional Congress, I mean, they met for, for three weeks and they were, and were headlined. And you've got to understand, they didn't have near the number of people in this nation as we do today. A few million. And not near the number of representatives. But, you, but the North and the South were already very, very different. Immigration was already, even though it was largely uh, Euro British, it was vastly European, and it was very different. And, and Benjamin Franklin stood up and, and addressed uh, the, the president of the Constitutional Congress, who was George Washington before he was president of the United States, and, and said that, he said, we're not going to be able to get any farther. Any farther. He said, our blood is too hot. And he said, I, he, said he made a motion that, they, that they, they dismissed for three days and then come back together and then see if they could ratify it. He said they were just too, too, too irate to be able to make a decision that day. And you know what? He said, he said this, and I'll quote him here. He's speaking to the Continental Congress. He's speaking to George Washington, the President, not of the United States at this point, but of the Continental Congress. He said, well, I am on my feet. I move you, sir, and I am astonished that it has not before, have been done before. For when we signed the Declaration of Independence, he said, there's something we did when we signed the Declaration of Independence that we forgot to do, and we've messed up. He said we had a chaplain to read the Bible and to pray daily. And I now move that when we meet again, we have a chaplain to meet with us and invoke the blessings of heaven. For sir, it has been wisely written, except the Lord build this city, they labor in vain who built it. That's Psalm 127 verse 1. And if it be true that a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, surely a nation cannot rise without his aid. You know what? They dismissed, came back, they prayed. And they ratified the Constitution that very day. And the great British Prime Minister William Gladstone called it the greatest document ever, stuck, ever struck from the brain of man. Benjamin Franklin later said that at that last session that would decide if Congress would ratify a constitution or not, that he sat looking at the carving on the back of the chair where the presiding officer, President Washington, was sitting. And he saw a carving of a sun, and he said, I wonder if it was a setting sun already or if it would be a rising sun. And he said later, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising sun, not a setting sun. Now, that constitution, if you read it, the constitution gave us the balance of our, what we call the balance of power. It gave us our executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Did you know that the reason they chose those three, that, look, all they knew, most of these people, all they knew was a monarchy. They didn't know anything else. They, were, they had not, the stewardship of civil government had not been placed in their hands, and they didn't know what to do, so they went to a Bible and said, maybe God knows something about how to govern in the affairs of men. 
And the reason that you and I have an executive office with the president, a legislative office with a Congress and a judicial uh, branch with the Supreme Court is because of this verse, for the Lord is our judge, that's judicial. The Lord is our lawgiver, that's our legislative. And the Lord is our king, that's our executive. He will save us. They could find no better form of government, they could find no more perfect union than that which they found under the three theocratic system of God. Alexander Hamilton said, for my own part, I sincerely believe, uh, sincerely esteem it, the Constitution, a system which without the finger of God never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. John Adams said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. What he said is, you take away God and the Bible from human government, and there's not a system of government in the world that can rule over men. By the way, look at our nation today. We're a good idea of that. He went on to say this. He said, avarice, ambition, that just, avarice is bitterness, ambition, revenge, or gallantry, would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You know what's sad today? You used to hear about our politicians talk about our Constitution. You don't hear that anymore. Do you know why? Because, because we're no longer a moral and a biblical people. As a nation. I understand that we have Christians and churches and, 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 are, and a remnant, and thank the Lord, uh, Isaiah begins, the book of Isaiah begins with these, with, uh, in the first chapter with these words, except the Lord had left them to us, a very small remnant. We should have been likened unto Sodom and Gomorrah. It doesn't take much. A very small remnant is, counts a great deal to, to God, and, and so we, that, and that's what we need. But he said, our constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. We're no longer a God-governed people, so our constitution no longer works for us. And it hasn't been that long because it wasn't that long ago within the last hundred years, one of our presidents, I believe it was Calvin Coolidge, said that the greatest, to live under the American Constitution is the greatest political privilege God ever gave to mankind. Giving us a bill of rights. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and, I, and our forefathers gave us the Bill of Rights. The, 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 the Bill of Rights, there were ten amendments to the Constitution. Of course, there have been others added since then. Uh, but they, they, James Madison said that they were given, quoting Leviticus 25, verse 10, to proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. I said this on Wednesday night. I believe that uh, over th one third of, our, of the t documents of our, of our nation, our founding documents our, given by our forefathers, over a third of them directly re reference the Bible and 16% of those documents directly quote the word of God. Look, look what he says here. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our judge. That means the Lord deter, de discerns between right and wrong. By the way, God decides what's right and what's wrong, not us. See, that's the problem within our democracy, which democracy means that the stewardship of government is in the hands of the citizens, but we have abused it. Because now we've said that we don't like what God says is right. We don't like what God says is wrong. So now we live in a day where there are no moral absolutes. There is no right. There is no wrong. If it feels good, do it. And who are you to judge me? Here was a people that said, well, the Lord's my judge. Do you know, what J you know what King David said? He said, search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's civil government, church. When's the last time we have prayed that prayer individually? When's the last time we've said, God, we're, we're, so, by the way, as a Christian, let's, we don't need to complain about the nation. We need to start getting back to self-examination. We need to, we, you know it would be good on an independent Sunday to come down here and put your knee on this altar in submission to your judge, your lawgiver, your king, and say, Lord, I'm submitting to your rule and authority in my life. I'll tell you what, that, that could change your family. 
That, that changed you. That changed your home. That changed this church. And I guarantee you that changed a portion of this country. God holds the scales of justice and a false ba- abomination. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. The, the, you listen to me. The great hypocrisy of America is our scorn for judgment. I'm going to say that again because I want you to remember it. The great hypocrisy of the United States of America is our scorn for judgment. Now, I'm as red, white, and blue as anybody in this room. I love America, and I, my, the, I, I, if we don't acknowledge our sins, we'll never repent of our sins. I'm for this country as much today as I've ever been, and I love this nation. I wouldn't live anywhere else. I wouldn't be a, a citizen of any other nation on this earth, but we want justice without judgment. We expect to be treated justly. We expect to be treated right, but we dare anybody to judge. That's what people say. How, that's a hypocrisy. Because we still have police officers and prisons and courts. Now, we've lost much of our sense of justice, and the more we find out, the more we try to... You know what man has found out as he's gotten away from the Bible? That we keep making laws. Everybody's just trying to... Be accountable to each other without being accountable to God. That's how our laws are based today. They're accountable to each other. Look, you'll never be accountable to each other properly without being accountable to God righteously. And that's why people will say things like this. Well, you're not God. No, but God's still God. And when people make that statement, they say it in such a way as if they believe that there is no God to whom they will give an account to. For the Lord shall judge his people, Deuteronomy 32, 36, Psalm 96, 13, before the Lord, for he cometh, and he's coming, church, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. The Lord is our judge. He discerns between right and wrong. The Lord is our lawgiver. He decides what is right and wrong. God, God knows what's right and wrong. He decides what's right and wrong. Whenever a man makes his own rules, there's moral decline, depravity, and destruction. The great hypocrisy of America is our scorn for judgment. The great lie of America is that man is progressively getting better and better all the time. Do you know how many laws, just our Congress, not state laws, not, not your town ordinances, do you know how many laws Congress has passed since 1789? Over 30,000. 30,000 plus. You know, if we, if we get back to the Bill of the Rights and the Ten Commandments, I think we could retain those, and we wouldn't probably need the other 30,000 plus. I want you to turn just a few pages over in your Bible to chapter 59 of the book of Isaiah. I want you to see these verses. I could quote them for you, but I want you to see them for yourselves. Isaiah 59, verse 12, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, speaking to, of the people before God, and our sins are testify against us when they go to court. The witnesses that come to bear witness against us are our own sins. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. Iniquity, the difference. A sin is something where we didn't know it was wrong, but we're wrong. You know, you didn't see the speed limit sign. Iniquity is when you see it and you blow through it at 85 anyway, and at 55 mile an hour. It's willfully. Verse 13, in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the hard words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. The Lord is our judge. He discerns. He decides what's right and wrong. He is our lawgiver, determining right and wrong. The Lord is our king. The Lord divinely rules and watches over his people. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse verse number 10. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 10. I want to read you a few verses here. Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. I love this verse. You say, if you could take all the water from this world, over two-thirds of this world is water, the oceans, every one of them, every stream, every creek, every lake, and 
You couldn't hold two tablespoons of water in the hollow of your hand. And God says that he could hold the waters of the world in his hand and meteth out heaven with the span. That's from uh, the span of a man's hands from the little finger to your thumb. God says, I don't hold the earth. I hold the universe in that, in that space for you to give us an idea. He's giving us an idea how big and how great he is. He said, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor hath taught him? Who are you to tell God what's right and what's wrong? With whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nation's are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the islands of very little thing. Look, if God, if you, if I had a bucket here this morning, I had a handful of pebbles, 225 some nations in this world to just start dropping a pebble in a bucket one at a time, 225 plus times. God says that's what entire nation, you know, America thinks pretty well of herself. God says you're a drop in a bucket. He said, I don't just hold America in my hand. He says, I hold this universe. I hold the heavens in the span of my hand. Who are you to tell me that my commandments are not, that my judgment is not just? To tell me that I am an unjust king, that I'm oppressive, that I am intolerant, that I'm not sensitive. When the Bible says God is love. In fact, every, every problem man has is man's fault. And every answer to every one of them, if there's a panacea, one answer for all things, it's Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and risen again 2,000 years ago and coming again for us. Sadly, the great embarrassment of America is our leadership. America's presidents no longer have the respect of the world. Uh, It's been this way for a long time. Republican and Democrat, just get off your hat. I had. Our national leaders used to be looked to with respect, looked to for direction, looked to for guidance when we were a moral nation. And we have not been looked to for a long time. We have dropped the ball. But there's good news. The Lord divinely rules and watches As king, he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And the good news is, he will save us. I mean, that ain't just good news for America. That's not just good news for Israel. That's good news for anybody in any country, anywhere in this world. The great salvation for America is the same as it is for all nations, as it always been. Don't forget, Jesus died on that cross 1,600 years before there was a United States of America. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Lord will deliver us. He will salvage us. He will save us from sin. He will save us from ourselves. You know, the problem is mankind today, do you know what? They look for the government to bail them out, to create another program, to put more money in their their bank account, to provide them a place to live, to give them money for groceries. And at the end of the day, the government cannot save you. But there there is one who can. And his name is Jesus Christ. I think we, we get back to winning people to Christ and people understanding that, that there is a God in heaven that created them, that loved them, that loved them so much he created them in his, his own image, in his own likeness, and gave us the privilege of a free will to, to choose to love God and walk in submission to him as God chose to love us. But that we have broken that fellowship, that we have sinned against him and transgressed against his holiness, and that God, instead of just wiping us out and starting over again, you know what God finally found after the Garden of Eden? And he, he, didn't, he didn't discover this for himself. He shows it for you and I to discover it. That even though it failed with one man and one woman in the Garden of Eden, even though it failed with the world of Noah, there is an answer for all these problems. And since Calvary, Christ has triumphed over sin, death, and hell for every man and has perfect government. By the way, you can live in a nation that no longer has a perfect form of government, but you can have a perfect form of government in your own life. 
Boy, America's looking toward the fall election. Who are we going to get this time? We don't even have a clue. We don't know. And it doesn't look good any way you go. Who will be our king? I love that in Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I also saw the Lord high and lifted up as train filled the temple. Isaiah, king Uzziah was a good king who reigned longer than almost any of Israel's kings, 52 years. And they said, what are we going to do now? There is an earthly throne that is empty. And God said, look here, there is a throne in heaven that is never empty. And folks, we just need to, to be reminded. And look, maybe our nation won't say this in and of itself ever again. But you and I can say, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Lord is our king, and he will save us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. You're not going to find a more perfect union than that. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior. You can come today. Somebody invited you to church. You can come today, and there's somebody that can take you someplace private, give you all the time you need, won't embarrass you, won't single you out, but somebody loved you enough to invite you to church, they'd be happy to come forward and help somebody with a Bible, show you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior, heaven as your home. And maybe to those that are saved, the vast majority of us, God's children, God's people, maybe today, we come and on bended knee before the throne of heaven, we just simply bow our hearts before him and say, oh Lord, you are my God. You are my judge, you are my lawgiver, you are my king. Father, we ask for your blessing now on the invitation in Jesus' name. Let's stand, the piano's playing, the altar's open. You need to come and bow before him right now, why don't you do that? Somewhere along the way, he spoke to your heart. When's the last time you said, oh Lord, search me? Oh Lord, try me. Maybe you're here and you don't know Christ as your savior. You can come and trust Him today. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Come into your heart. Receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and your Lord. A perfect judge, a perfect lawgiver, a perfect and a great and a soon coming King.